How are you doing? Well, what a great evening. I love that worship. The presence of God was wonderful. Well, it was where I was standing. I'm sure it was where you were as well. Hey, everyone, at the back. All the naughty boys got the back. How are you doing? I want to say it's great to be with Mark and Karen. We love them very much indeed. We've had so many good times together. And uh, we had Mark speak at our church, uh, um, New Wine Wales, New Wine Cymru uh, leadership gatherings, and he's done a great job and served us proud, and we're thrilled with what God is doing with this church and through this church. This church is famous. We had a student lunch this afternoon, and I said, oh, to some of the students, uh, oh, I'm going up to uh, Trinity Church Challenge. Oh, I love that church, they said. They love you. They, they, they're not even a part of you, and they love you. So your fame has gone before you. So we're really pleased to be here and um, just share a few thoughts. Now, what I'd like to do is just get straight into it for the sake of time. Is that all right? Yeah. Well, I'm going to read a few passages of scriptures. You don't, uh, don't have to open them, uh, uh, read them, open your Bible, but I'll read them real quick. And I'd like you to take note of a few words, uh, these type of words, how Jesus gives his power and gives his authority away to people. And uh, we see that he did it to the disciples here and there in the New Testament. That's what I'm going to read about. But these things are written so that we can apply them to our own lives. They're not written just for them. They're written for now. They're written for us so that we can go, oh, that's for me. That's for us. That's for now. And um, it's not just for the general us. It's for you on the seat. It's for you. And I want you to enter into this text as I read it and just go, oh, that is for me. And what Jesus did then and gave then, I can receive now. So open your hearts and allow faith to be created. You know, one of the most important things that we can allow ourselves and give ourselves to is the creation of faith. Uh, there's a passage of scripture when God gave a whole load of promises to the Israelites. And it says they, they entered into the promise, uh, second generation of Israel, entered into God's promise, God's land, God's purposes, because they mingled his word with faith. And so I'm going to read a couple of scriptures, so words of God. And I want you to have the courage to say, do you know what? This is for me. So should we do that? It don't take two minutes. And then we'll get on. Luke 9, Jesus had called the twelve together. That's, this is for you, not just for them, it's for you. He called the twelve together and he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and cure diseases. Luke 10, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome the power of the enemy and nothing will harm you. That's for you. Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of the nations. Acts 1, this is for you, not just for them. Acts 1, you will receive power. Isn't that fantastic? This is for you. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Cheltenham. Oh, sorry, I misread it. Jerusalem. <laughs> you will be my witnesses in Cheltenham. Where's the next region to Cheltenham? Gloucestershire. <laughs> Southwest and the ends of the earth. That's for you. Now, last night as I was watching Strictly... <laughs> I got really bored. Now, that is not to say that Strictly is boring. I just got really bored. And I said to Sarah, Sarah, I'm going to go upstairs. And I went upstairs to pray. I thought I'd better pray because I hadn't a clue what I was going to speak on tonight. And so I said, Lord, you've got to give me something. And in the moment, I said, Lord, I just bring my mind to your cross. And I just submit my thoughts to you. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will fill my heart and my thoughts with Whatever you want me to preach, and I'm waiting and expecting God to maybe show me a verse of scripture or, you know, oh, uh, something like that. And the most unusual picture came into my mind that I have never, ever had come into my consciousness when I was praying before. Would you like to know what it is? It was a picture of Florence Nightingale's hat. 
I can't possibly say, you can't possibly ask me to preach on Florence Nightingale's hat. I've, I've been a preacher in Wales for over 30 years, and I've never heard a message on Florence Nightingale's hat in the valleys, not once. No, 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 what's it coming to, Florence? You've got to preach from the scriptures, man. Not Florence Nightingale's hat. I'll go back to English now. Oh, you want to listen? <laughs> and there I saw a picture of Florence Nightingale's hat. And then I saw a picture of Florence Nightingale's lamp because she's known as the Lady of the Lamp. Very interesting lady, Florence Nightingale. Um, she, she became famous uh, because of the Crimean War, as you know, in 1853. Well, I say as you know, you know I'm presuming you may. I mean, I didn't know till I Googled it last night. Um, <laughs> Don't you do that with all the pictures you get? And, um, but the interesting thing I learned about it is she was a devout Christian. And at the age of 17, she said this, God spoke to me and called me to his service. And then she goes on to say, and this is a direct quote as well, God called me to do something toward lifting the load of suffering from the helpless and the miserable. Now, whenever I get a picture, God tends to speak to me in my own language. You know, we can all, we, God speaks, we all have our own spiritual language where God speaks to us. And uh, when he gives a symbol or a picture to me, and I would suggest this may be the same for you as well, he'll give you a picture that is, the meaning is quite obvious to you when you're praying. So he doesn't give you a symbol or a picture as you're asking God to lead you and guide you prophetically and suddenly say, there you go, I've given you a symbol or a picture in your mind's eye. Try and work out what it means. <laughs> and Of course, it could mean anything. Now, what he does, he speaks to you in your own language. So something that is meaningful in your life or experience or history that you can make sense of. So whenever I see a picture of a hat... I immediately know what a hat means to me. A hat to me speaks of authority. You see, the head speaks of authority. It's a symbol of authority in the Bible. But when you put a hat on, it might be a general's hat, a captain's hat, a policeman's hat. When you put a particular hat on, it speaks of a particular aspect, a particular realm, sector of authority that you operate in. So when I get a picture of Florence Nightingale's hat, or more accurately, bonnet, it's speaking to me of a particular area of authority that he wants you to be reminded of, encouraged of, take notice of, and pursue with confidence because you are called to serve him in that particular area. Lawrence, Fl Florence... I believe this. God wants you to go into the torn, the war-torn world of today's humanity and to bring the power of his healing. I also saw her light and the light of his transforming message. I want to encourage you, every single member sitting on this seat, I want to encourage you on sitting on this seat. Not, I'm not talking to the leadership now. They know this. You know this. I'm not talking to the leadership now, although it's for you too. But I'm talking to every single member here that you are called and you are permissioned and you have been given authority by God to go out into your Monday morning experience, your workplace, your friendship groups, your show social space, your academic world, your student world, to go out there and to bring the healing of Jesus to people's hearts and to people's bodies, which will open up a way for the light of his transforming message to be listened to, to be heard, to be understood, and to be received into people's lives. You, the power of physical healing 
out there in a broken, hurting, war-torn world is phenomenally power to, powerful to open people up to receiving Jesus and his message, his light. Sarah and I went to the States a little while ago and we were talking to some friends of ours, Ted and Joyce, and they were sharing how their parents were so resistant to the work that they were doing. They were church planters. Uh, and they were so resistant to the fact that they were serving God, establishing a church and in the ministry. They thought they were wasting their lives, wasting their time. They could be making far much more money doing other things, which is probably true. But they just did not understood. And they were very unsupportive. And not just unsupportive, but very resistant to what they were doing. And it was a great heartache to this church planting couple. And in the conversation, Joyce told me how her mum had been suffering for years with incredibly painful arthritis. And it's so bad now that she was virtually uh, immobile and she was housebound and her dad was the one who had to do all the housework and go out shopping and all that type of thing. And I said to her over the kitchen table, Joyce, um, do you think that your mum would allow me and Sarah to go round to pray for her? to be healed of the pain of her arthritis so that she may get her movement back and freedom from pain. So she did a very brave thing. She phoned her up and said, we got some friends over from England. <laughs> Why do people do that? We got some friends over from England and uh, they'd like to come and pray for you. And she said yes. So a little drive away, about 40 minutes drive away, went to their condo, and we, there she was. The dad was out because he was doing the shopping. She was there. We got her to stand up, and she struggled to stand up, and you could see the pain that she was in. Sarah put her hand on one side of her hand there, and we prayed a simple prayer, and immediately all the pain left her down one side. And she got hold of Sarah's hand and went, oh, put your hand on the other side like that. And she prayed again, and all the pain left her on the other side. At this point... The dad came back, <laughs> carrying boxes or, or, you know, of food. But he could see that his wife was totally free from pain. And her heart and spirit and attitude and demeanor changed and be set free. And tears were coming down her face. And when he saw what had happened to her, he began to weep as well. And the two couples, because of that, together, in the front room there, prayed a, pray prayed a prayer to Jesus that he would... Forgive them, come into their lives, and bring the transforming light of his presence and power to them. And that's what happened. Amen. Somebody who was so resistant now found Jesus Christ for themselves because of the healing power of Jesus. Florence Nightingale's hat is what I saw when I prayed for this church. And I want to encourage you, every single one of you, that God is for you. And he has permissioned you and called you and given you authority to go and take his healing to the wounded and the broken out there. And it will make way for his light to shine through your lives. So this calling is for Monday morning. It's for everyday living. It's for those who are on the school run, like Tammy, who's made friends with uh, another mum where her kids go to school. And now she gives a lift to one of them. And uh, the other week, wasn't so long ago, she was giving a lift to work to one of the mums, and as she opened the door car, and she got in, and she sat on the seat. She said to Tammy, oh, my shoulder is too painful to move and too painful to touch. And Tammy turned around to her as she's now driving down Carmarthen Road. Would you like me to pray for you? And she said, oh, yes, please. So with a Hands on the wheel and her eyes on the road. You know how the song goes, hands on the wheel and your eyes. Because you can't close your eyes when you're praying and you're driving. You know that, don't you? And you can't lay hands on somebody when you're praying and you're driving. So she eyes on the road, hands on the wheel. 
And she just said, Lord Jesus, would you please heal Rachel, because that was her name, Rachel, of her shoulder. And I command and ask that shoulder to be healed right now in Jesus' name. And immediately, all the pain left her. And Rachel went, that is weird. (laughs) And she's on a journey to come into faith. She's been to church a couple of times since then, on a journey. So if you're on the school run, this is for you. Or maybe... It's in the workplace. You see, um, Nikki was, an, uh, was a boss of a nursing home, and she noticed that she knew that one of her employees uh, hadn't been to work for about six weeks, and, it found, and she found out the reason that she was in tolerable pain for some kind of, I think the problem was an abscess on the abdomen, and it was sapping all of her strength. She'd been in bed for about six weeks. She was in a desperate condition. So Nikki decided to go and see this work colleague personally. She knocked on her door and uh, her daughter opened and she went upstairs to see Claire who was lying down on the bed. She hadn't been out of bed for about six weeks and she was drained of energy and strength and she said, Claire, would you like me to pray for you for Jesus to heal you? And she said, yes, please. And so she prayed this simple prayer. Claire, pray this, she said. This is a great prayer. Healing belongs to me. And Claire went, healing belongs to me. Because of what Jesus has done. Because of what Jesus has done. Because of the cross. Because of the cross. I received my healing. And then Nikki prayed for Claire. She said, Claire, healing belongs to you. Because of what Jesus has done. Because of the cross. Receive your healing now. And immediately the pain left her and her strength returned. And she got up and she went down to the front room and her daughter says, Mum, what's happened? She says, I've been healed. Well, if you've been healed, ma'am, she says, because I speak like that in Wales, if you've been healed, ma'am, we'll jump up and down. And she began to jump up and down. And now at that point, Jason came home. Now Jason is her husband. Now Jason is a lovely man. Now he's lovely. He's got tattoos on his tattoos and scars on his scars and muscles upon his muscles. He loves working out in the gym. He's a lovely man, but he is known for violence. He likes football too, but he, won't, he can't play anymore because he's got a lifetime ban for violence on the football field. <laughs> and the other thing about Jason is that he's known for road rage. If you cut him up in the car, he will chase after you, open your car door, drag you out, and beat the living daylights out of you. Apart from that, he is the loveliest man you'd ever want to meet. So Jason walks in, and he says to his wife, now these are his exact words, Claire, no, I'm sorry, what's happened to you, love? You look radiant. And she says, Jace, I've been healed. And he shares with me at his baptism some weeks later, the first thought that went through his mind was this, oh no, there is a God. (laughs) He comes to church the following week with his wife, first time they've ever been to church. She's up and about now, she's healed, she's back at work. She comes to church the following week, sits at the back where the naughty boys sit. Thank you. Sits at the back. At the back of the service, I know what's happened, so I sidle over, sat next to him, and introduced myself. And he says, oh, you never guess what happened to me last week. And he tells the story about Claire. And I share with him the light of Jesus' transforming message, that he died upon the cross for the things that we've done wrong. That as we turn to him, he forgives us unconditionally. That he comes into his life and his power and his presence transforms us and sets us free, even from road rage. Sets us free and makes us new. And I said, would you like to pray to Jesus for this to happen for you and for you to know his forgiveness? And he prayed there on the blue chair in the back of the room. The following week he returns and he says to me, Julian, I know my life changed that day after we prayed that prayer. He said, because I left the car park of the church, and as I was driving out, somebody cut me up and knocked my wing mirror off. (laughs) And all the angels in heaven went, and do you know what he said? He said, oh no, you silly Billy. (laughs) Totally transformed life. So if you are in the workplace like Nikki, or you're on the school run like Tammy, 
Or if you're just hanging out with your mates, like Matthew the other week was having a barbecue with Carl, and as he was chatting with Carl over a barbecue and a burger, Carl just explained that he couldn't be playing football anymore because he damaged his shoulder in a martial arts injury. And Matthew there just said, look, well, why don't I pray for you? And there they were over a burger. He prayed for him, and the pain went immediately, and he got healed. And the following Sunday, Carl was there with his live-in partner Natalie and their nine children. And all of them now on a journey to faith. Because, Because the authority to go into a hurting world where people are broken and wounded and bruised physically and emotionally, has been given to us as the church and has been given to you. And all these stories, I'm telling you, are not about professional ministries or ordained people. They're about people in the pew who have everyday lives and everyday jobs and have to cope with the stuff that ordinary people have to cope with every day. And you have been given... A calling, a service, a power, a permission, an opportunity to go and do the same. And then one of our girls was having her hair cut. And as she was having her hair done in the local hairdressers, the hairdressers was chatting away and was talking about all the anxiety and the worries and the problems that she was having in that season of her life. And and one of our girls turned around and said, you know you don't have to live like this with all this worry, and began to share her story about how the message of Jesus had changed her life and brought peace where she used to have anxiety. And said, would you like me to pray for you? And she said, yes. So the hairdresser got in the hairdresser's chair. (laughs) Nikki got out of it put her hand upon her shoulder and prayed for the Holy Spirit to come and bless her and take away her worry and anxiety. And after a few moments, the hairdresser sitting in the chair turned round to her colleague and goes, wow, that's fantastic, you have a go. <laughs> so if you're, a hair in the hair, if you're having your hair done, if you're on the school run, if you're in the workplace, if you're hanging out with your mates, this is for you. And fellas, it's not just for the girls. I was having my hair cut a little while ago. And I go to the same hairdresser. I don't know why, because I give me a terrible haircut. <laughs> but I go to the same hairdresser. And Michelle, halfway through my haircut, with five guys in the room, you know, waiting for the seats, disappeared for about three and a half minutes, and I'm left with half a haircut. And I think, where's this woman gone? <laughs> And then she comes back and says, Julian, oh, Julian, I can't carry on. Oh, I've got a bad knee. She, well, what happened three months ago, she fell over a walking stick and damaged her cartilage and a ligament. And she's saying, it's, it's hurting me so much to walk around and hobble around cutting your hair. I just can't ca- put any weight to it and carry on. And I said to Michelle, because I go to the same place and I tell them stories and all stuff about what God can do for people's lives. And I said, Michelle, you know that in our church we, we pray for people and they often get healed. Of, of things like your suffering. Would you like me to pray for you now? And she went, go on then. Now there's five guys in the hairdressers watching. And I, there's Michelle. And I said, Michelle, don't close your eyes because it'll look weird. And don't kneel on the floor because it'll hurt. But there she was, scissors and a comb. I said, pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, heal me now. And in a crowded barbers, she went, Lord Jesus, heal me now. And I said, Lord, I pray you will heal Michelle's knee. I command that pain to go in Jesus' name. I said, move your knee. And she moved it, and she went, oh. Oh, that's stunning, that is. Oh, 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 Julian. Oh, I feel emotional. I feel, I feel emotional. Well, she was totally healed. All the girls cutting their hair, their, their jaws dropped. I went back about three months ago to have a, get my hair cut again. And I said, how's the knee? And she said, Julian, I cried for days after that. <laughs> Cry for days. Touched by God. Guys, you can do it in the hairdressers. Girls, 
You can do it when you're having your hair done. School run, workplace, with your mates, doesn't matter where you are, you can do it. Because, as we've just read, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, says Jesus. Therefore, go. Basically, he said, all authority will be given to me. Now, I'm giving a whole stack of it to you. Go and do what I did and talk, teach what I teach and say what I say and live like I live and you'll bring my light into a hurting and broken world. So, as we, uh, there's three things that uh, we need to add to this authority, presence and power and call that God has given us if we really want to see this happen there's three things that you must do persistently if you really want to see this outworked in your life. And I want to encourage you to do it because I believe with all my heart that God is calling you and has permissioned you and given you authority to do it. So here's like triggers, triggers to pull up. Release the power and the presence. Would you like to know what they are? You'll be disappointed. The first one. Courage. You have to add courage to the call and the promise and the authority and the permission that God has given you to do this. Without courage, it doesn't happen. Because without courage, we don't step up to the plate. We don't ask the question, would you like me to pray? We don't make the call. We have to add courage to this incredible opportunity and call that God has given us. And no matter how many times we pray for sick people out there in the real world, every single time you do it, it's like the first time you do it, and it really takes courage to do it. You know, I, I've prayed, me and Sarah, we've prayed for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people to be healed. And it is, we have seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people healed. We, we have. But a few weeks ago, no matter how, seeing this for years and years ago, I was sitting in white stuff as Sarah was actually in the changing room trying on a cardigan. <laughs> and I was waiting, flicking through my emails, waiting for her to come out. And as I was waiting, I heard a, a girl in the shop walk into the... The clo another clothes area carrying stuff. She was a staff member saying to a colleague, oh, I've, I've, I really hurt my knee at the gym. And she was hobbling around carrying stuff. And I thought, oh, no, that's done it now. I've heard her. Now I've got to ask. I hate it when that happens. Oh, no, I've heard that she's in pain. And now I'm obligated to do something about it. Because she's only an earshot away. And so... I'm waiting for it to come out. And as I'm waiting for it to come out, these are the things I'm thinking. One, how am I going to approach this so I don't look weird? <laughs> and secondly, as the time lapse is coming, I feel myself beginning to get nervous. And my heartbeat begins to raise. Have you ever had that? Or when you're going to... And then I feel I'm beginning to get a bit breathless. And I'm getting breathless with anxiety, some fear. <sighs> Ooh, and I say, oh, no, I've got to calm down now. <laughs> I've got to control my breathing so that when, my, when my, I ask her... And approach her, my voice doesn't tremble, my cheeks aren't flushed, and my bo voice isn't breathy, and she thinks I'm a weirdo. <laughs> you see, I've done this hundreds and hundreds of times, but it's like the first time, and it takes courage. And I'm the same as you. I'm a coward at heart when it comes to this. And so I said to this lady as she came out, I said, oh, excuse me. And she turned around to me and she thought I was going to ask her about an item of clothing. I said, excuse me. And she said, yes, like, can I help you? And I said, oh, I, I don't mean to be rude, but I, I couldn't help overhearing you that you damaged your knee. Um, this might sound really strange and unusual. And I appreciate that. But back home in my church, we pray for a lot of people who have those type of conditions and they often get healed. Would you like me to quickly pray for you now because you don't have to live with that pain? 
And do you know what she went? She went, go for it. Like that. She went, it was even that. She went, go for it. And I said, what's your name? She said, Caroline. And I said, Caroline, would you pray this prayer with me? Lord Jesus, please heal me now. And she went, Lord Jesus, heal me now. And I said, Father, would you please heal Caroline's knee? Pain go in the name of Jesus. I prayed for her and I said, how is it? Gone. She said, you can come again. <laughs> she never gave me a discount. <laughs> no, I think that was least worth a discount. But I'm telling you that story to tell you that I am a coward at heart. I first realized I was a coward at heart. Just checking how long I got. Oh, I'm not going to tell you that story. Because I've only got a few minutes left. I first realized I was a coward at heart. <laughs> now, this is, now I'm putting the injury time on you, all right? Okay, coward at heart. It was early on in our ministry. We, 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 we'd been married about a year. We were in full-time ministry. We were going home late at, what, late at night, and we were really hungry. And there was a fish and chip shop, and we'd call into the fish and chip shop. And, and as I walked into the fish and chip shop, but it was quite late at night to get some food, I walked in, and I had this feeling, oh, that rose up within me that I needed to preach the gospel in the fish and chip shop. I go, oh, no, I'm on any of the chips. I hate it when that happens. Oh, I could feel it, this incredible need to pray. Oh, give me a break. And I looked around and I thought, maybe, maybe I could hide. Or maybe it's just for somebody here. And I looked around and as I looked around, I saw a man who was a who turned out to be the owner of Fish Chip Shop, come from a back door to the counter area. And as I saw him, now you think it's bad now, I've got to preach the gospel, this gets worse. I saw him and I heard these, vo these words crystal clear in my consciousness. Tell that man he's in danger of dying and he needs to prepare to meet God. Oh no. <laughs> it was bad before, now it's got really worse. And so I queued up. And I'm mustering all the courage I can get now. And it comes to my turn, and he's serving. And I come up to him, and with the fish and chip shop, I looked him right in the eye, and I went, I'll have sausage and chips twice, please. <laughs> <laughs> and I was out of there. No, I was gone. I would, couldn't sleep all that night because I knew that God had spoken to me and I should have done something. And I woke up, you know, well, I eventually got to sleep eventually in the early hours. And when I woke up, I opened my eyes and from the top corner, it was really weird. It's only ever happened to me once this, thankfully. Or they'd be sending me somewhere else. Uh, top corner of the room, I heard this voice, use your gifts. And I said to Sarah, Sarah, weird thing happened to me last night and I explained the story. And Sarah said, Julian, that is God, and you have to tell that man. Now, almighty God from heaven tells me to do something, and I think about it. Sarah, <laughs> I'm on it like a flash. <laughs> so, I pray this prayer, because I really do, uh, Basically, I'm telling you I'm a coward. I'm, I pray this, after all that, I'm praying this prayer, because I'm praying... A get out, a get out of jail prayer. Lord Jesus, if you, if you really want me to do this, let him be at the fish and chip shop, half past nine in the morning, because I've dropped Sarah off at teacher training college. I drop her off at nine o'clock, and then I, it takes me half an hour to get there. Let him be in the, in the fish and chip shop at half past nine in the morning. And if, he, if he's there, then I will do it. Now, that's a great prayer to pray, because I know no one's in fish and chip shops at half past nine in the morning. Nobody. I drive up, park the car opposite the road. I look across the road. He's cleaning the windows. <laughs> and even then, I didn't do it properly. Because, you know, I was such a coward. I got a piece of Christian literature. And I went in. And he said, can I help you? And I said, well, I was here last night, and uh, I know this sounds strange, but I'm a Christian, and I really felt the Lord give me a message for you, and it's this. Uh, you're in grave danger of dying, and you need to prepare to meet God. And he said this, I've known that for two years. I didn't know he was seriously ill, seriously ill. And I bottled out then. I should have sat him down over a coffee, shared the gospel with him, 
led him to Jesus. I should have. But I said, well, here's a piece of literature and I'm gone. This will help you. You see? I'm like you. I'm like you, I am. I'm frightened. And the biggest thing that stops us from offering prayer, that releases, brings healing to people, that opens them up to Jesus, is not that he can't do it and that he won't do it. It's just that we're frightened. And I know what that's like. And that's why over many years I've learned this simple principle. That's telling me to shut up. It, we have to do the thing that God can't do for us. That is mingle courage with our calling, with our authority and with our faith. And just step out of the boat and risk our reputations and take a risk and risk it all going wrong and risk them not getting healed where often they, but they often do. Just risk it, take a risk and go for it and see God do something extraordinary. It, Florence Nightingale, it was courage that took that young girl. Oh, she, she went against all cultural norms. She went into us, the conditions were absolutely horrendous and she went and did it. I want to encourage you to do it. It's not rocket science. You, you, you just have to exercise courage, like God said to Joshua. Be courageous. Be courageous and do what I've asked you. Now the second thing quickly is we have to marry courage with this, faith in crisis. You see, every time you pray for somebody or you see them in a, in a weak condition or they're ill or something happens, it's a crisis. There are no miracles without crises. If you want to be a miracle maker, crisis is your friend. We try all of our lives trying to avoid crisis. Jesus stepped into crisis. He was an expert in crisis management. Every, every miracle we see was a crisis. We're trying to run away from it. But Jesus stepped into it. And we have to learn this art of in the moment of crisis, holding on to our conviction and our faith of knowing who God is and what he can do. You see, faith is easy in the worship meeting and it's easy in our prayer room. But the moment faith is challenged is that when we are faced with the facts of crisis. So let me give you an example. We ran a healing cafe we ran a healing cafe uh, just before Christmas and a, 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 a fellow heard about healing going on, he said, that was his words, and he walked in and somebody said to me, oh, would you come and pray for this gentleman who's over there? And so the pastor asked me to pray for this guy. And as I walked in, I said, well, what's the problem? He said, oh, this is a serious one. Now, the moment he said that, I could feel my confidence and faith in God to heal. I've seen heal many times. It was like a trap door had been opened, and I could feel it draining away in one step. And then, as I began to take the second step, he says, oh, the doctor says this involves, might involve amputation. Vroom. Then it was going really down the pan. And on the third step, I had to say to myself, Julian, get a grip. This is true now. Get a grip. You have seen God heal. You know he wants to heal. You know he can heal. And so the third step is, hi, my name's Julian, how are you? Now, three steps. Because it's crisis that causes your faith to drain away. Have you noticed that? And we have to learn to be able to hold on to faith, rehearse the facts, rehearse the stories, rehearse the creed, rehearse what we know God can do and wants to do in the light of Scripture in those moments and submit our mind to it so the, so the voice of the, of the crisis doesn't overwhelm the voice of faith that is informed by the facts of God's Word. One, oh no. Two, oh, it's worse. Get a grip. How can I help you? So this was the story. 
Two years ago, he uh, fell off a ladder. Totally and completely smashed his ankle up so that the bone came totally outside his leg. He ended up having 10 plates and I think it was 37, 38 stitches and multiple screws. His, he'd been stitched up so much that he didn't need amputation for the condition, but the swelling and the pain was continuous every day that the medic says the only solution was amputation for the pain. Didn't need it medically, but for the pain. So he came along, swollen, hobbling like this, in pain every day. That's why he came along. He wasn't a Christian, by the way. I got him to stand up. I prayed a prayer for him. Basically, it was this. Lord Jesus, heal me now. Lord, take away this pain, swelling, go down, heal him. Command it to go in Jesus' name, using the authority that God had given. How do you feel now? No different. Mm. We'll pray again. Pray it again. How do you feel now? No different. Hmm. Crisis. God can do it. God wants to do it. Prayed again. How do you feel now? No different. I tell you what, this time we're going to go for a walk. Like Jesus told the man who was blind, to go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And when he did that simple act, he says he came back seeing. Let's go for a walk and trust that when you come back, God's going to do something. I had to hold him by the arm because he was hobbling. And it was about from here to that, where that chap is there sitting down. And we walked like this, hobbling. Hobbled all the way over. Hobbled all the way back. When we got back, I said, how's the pain now? A lot better. Within 10 minutes, totally healed. All the swelling had gone down. He could walk properly, no pain. He gave his life to Jesus that night. Isn't that amazing? But here's the thing. When you meet somebody in pain, where it's pain of the heart or pain of the leg or pain of the neck or whatever it is, a long condition, a short condition, in that moment, it's a crisis. It's a crisis for them, but it's a crisis of your faith because those, those conditions challenge your faith in that moment. And we have to cultivate the ability... To hold on to our faith in crisis and rehearse the facts, what God can do, what he wants to do, and what he said in the light of scripture. Now let me mention, qualify it by this one thing. As you look through the, life of, the, the light of scripture, you never see Jesus on one occasion rebuking or challenging anybody who needs healing for their lack of faith. Never, never, never do you say, oh, you haven't been healed because your lack of faith. Never. Don't see it once. But you do see time and time again Jesus challenging the people that he has called to do the praying for healing, his disciples, over their lack of faith. So if you're sick, Mark, Jesus will not in any way challenge you about your lack of faith. That's not an issue to Jesus. But he will challenge me as I come to pray for you as a disciple. And if you look through the scriptures, you'll find the disciples. He spent three years challenging the disciples to hold on to their faith in crisis. 5,000 people need healing. Feed them, Philip. <gasps> they're in the storm. And the waves are coming in and they're about to sink as they're in the boat. And they turn around to Jesus and say, Jesus, don't you care? We're drowning. And he gets up and calms the storm. And he rebukes the disciples and says, oh, you of little faith. In other words, basically he's saying, come on, guys, why didn't you do that? He challenges his disciples. He will challenge me. But he's so tender-hearted for those who are in need of prayer. And my, this message, this part of the message for you to, tonight, this part of this message, is not for those who are in need of prayer. It's for us who have been called to do the praying. By the way, that's you. That's you. Learn to hold on to faith in crisis 
Learn to bring courage against your fear. And finally, persist in prayer. You see, people don't always get healed the first time of prayer. Often they do, but they don't always. So Jesus prayed for a blind man twice. In the light of Scripture, we see this. Pray and persist in prayer. Where in Scripture do you ever see that we shouldn't persist in prayer? And it applies to healing too. So I remember Sarah, many years ago, had a neurological disability and she had the mobility of an 80-year-old woman. It was a sports injury and she um, it was inoperable. She often became paralyzed um, round, down one side of her body and she was in pain every single day. Her kids, our kids, couldn't hug her or hold her too strongly or come up to her running and jolt her because if she jolt her, she would be in bed in, in agony for days and days and days. If I drove over a bump in the car, it would send her into spasms. If I was too heavy on the clutch as I changed gear, it would send her into spasms. So that's why I went over to an automatic. Now, that was the reason, because I just had to make sure that my gear, even my gear changes were smooth. It was, it was terrible. And we would have friends and ministers and come to our house and stay and they pray for her and pray for her, pray for her, and she didn't get healed, she didn't get healed. They prayed and prayed and prayed and it went after year after year after year after year till one night a friend of mine came to our church and he spoke on healing and he said, there's somebody here with a neck condition and Sarah stood up. Mm, see what happens here. And I can remember Sarah's like sitting there and I'm sitting over there and Sam, my friend, prayed for her. And actually he prayed that prayer, healing belongs to me because of what Jesus has done because of the cross. I received my healing and he prayed it over her and he said, Sarah, where's the pain now? And she said, it's not any better. So he prayed again. How's the pain? It's not any better. And he prayed again. It's not any better. He prayed again. It's not any better. On about the sixth go, I'm think, and this is true now, I'm thinking to myself, Sam, tell her to sit down. You're ruining the meeting. <laughs> and this is my wife. On the seventh or eighth go, he says, where's the pain now? And Sarah went, there is a, maybe a, a tiny improvement, maybe 2% improvement, that's all. He prayed another time, and it increased. After about three or four prayers after that, she was totally healed. Never suffered from it since. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Absolutely astonishing. But there's one thing I learned. Persistence in prayer. I believe with all of my heart that God has called and commissioned and permissioned you as a church with an area of authority to bring healing and the light of his transforming message into the outside world. I want to encourage you to mingle that calling with courage. Oh, it will not happen unless you get courage. Go and buy it and get hold of it in bucket loads. Every day, every day, add courage. Cultivate this discipline of thinking an attitude to, to hold on to your conviction of faith in what God can do, wants to, wants to do, and has said he wants to do in the light of Scripture, in your mind and heart, as you are faced with various crises of challenge that you may face when you go into prayer. You must cultivate that. And thirdly, don't be put off when somebody isn't healed the first time. Pray again and again and again as long as you can, and as long as they feel comfortable. As long as they feel comfortable. And we have often seen the greater healings after a number of prayers, and as long as they feel comfortable. And as you do this, you will consistently grow into a culture of healing within your church community. So now, in our church, people get healed when we're preaching, they get healed most Sunday mornings. They can get healed in the worship. And I'll tell you one great story, and I'm going to finish on this, and then we're going to put it into practice, and you're going to do the healing. Is that okay? Little girl, six years old. 
heard about a man who wasn't our church, church down the road, who's practiced putting this into practice, heard that uh, his foot had been numb for many, many years. So she drew a picture of his foot and said, can I put this little picture, six years old, on your foot? Because I think that Jesus will heal. And he said, okay. So she put a little simple picture on his foot. And as he placed it on her foot, he got totally healed. You see, what that, that is when you have a culture of healing. When a six-year-old child can offer a prayer in a six-year-old way, and it's not on the superstars, it's not much how theology you've got, it's not much how experience you've got, there's something of the presence of God released because you've been practicing this so much, it now becomes second nature to the people of God that even a six-year-old child can actually participate. That's where he wants you to go. And that's where you can go as you persist, as you exercise faith in crisis and add courage to your call and conviction. Amen. So we've got 10 minutes. Is that okay, Mark? 10 minutes is enough. Right. I've been praying and I've got a few conditions here that I, that I believe that the Lord has shown me that are in this room tonight, conditions that you have. Now, they're gonna, I'm going to focus on physical conditions, like pain, not necessarily unseen conditions that you, you have to go to the doctor to get tested. I'm going to focus on physical conditions so that we can see and observe God healing now to encourage our faith and encourage your faith. Is that okay? I'm going to ask you to do the healing. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to call out a few conditions. If they relate to you, I want you to stand up. Then I want in, in, in twos or threes at the most uh, to gather around that person. I would like you to ask them, well, what did you stand for? Somebody stand for a knee. Say, well, yeah, that, that, the bad knee's me. And then I want you to ask the person to pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, heal me now. And then pray this prayer over them. Lord, will you please heal this bad knee? And then use the authority that Jesus has given you. And say, knee, I command you to be healed and the pain to go now in Jesus' name. And ask them to see if there's any improvement. And if there is any improvement, identifiable improvement, let us know. So I'll say, put your hand up if there is and we can pray again. Okay? And you can do that a few times, and I'll call you back, and we'll see, and we'll we'll see where we go from there. Is that okay? You're comfortable with that?